Hey there, it's Eric Rhodes, and we are on day number 147 live, and we have a special guest today, artist Susie Baker. Welcome, Susie. Hi, good to be here. I'm or glad you're I've here. Always been in my home. Well, we get get a wall of paintings. We get to see a lot of a lot of beautiful work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it just intentionally put there for the event. So, do you have a uh, one of those uh, uh, moving walls for for art shows and things like that that you use? That's exactly what it is. It's one of those carpeted panels, like for trade shows and things like that. But it helps me get my painting up off the ground and my frames from being scratched. And then when I, I at the kind of glancing around, and of course there's lots more paintings than what's in frames, but um, yeah, helps me keep things organized. So what are you going to talk about today? Okay, so today I'm going to cover just some studio basics. It's things that I go over with students and ways of doing things so that you're not filling up your studio or... Um, painting things that are always just so precious that it's intimidating by using um, loose linen pet tablets that you can carry to um, workshops or out into the field or to painting groups. And then we're going to talk about how to mount those. And if we have time, how to stick them in frames. So just a okay, practical cool. thing. All right. That yeah. sounds like fun. Okay. Well, I'm going to drop off and drop you off here for a second and we're going to uh, make a couple of announcements and then we'll be back. Okay, see you next. All right, terrific. So it, as I said, it's day number 147 live. I'm Eric Rhodes from Plein Air Magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, et cetera. And it has been an absolutely crazy week uh, because, you know, as you may or may not know, I have triplets and all three are going into college in the same week. So we got back, uh, we, we left yesterday and we got back uh, this morning, or, or not not this morning, late last night. Um, and then I'm doing the broadcast today. And then as soon as the broadcast is over, we're in the car and driving up to Arkansas to take our third, or actually our second son, our second child, our, our first born son. And then uh, we drop him off in Arkansas. Then we're going to fly out of Little Rock and go back to the lake. So uh, in theory, uh, I'll be here tomorrow and then we'll, uh, we'll figure out uh, where we go from there. So it's going to be kind of a crazy time. And then I'll be back, back at the lake. Welcome hey. Susie. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, I have so, to say that there are some great reasons to sign up for, um, Realism Live. I was, I participated in the Plein Air Live, but let me just give you one really good reason. I've taken a workshop from Dan Gerhardt's before. He is nearly impossible to get into a workshop with. And when you consider the expense of traveling or bringing him to you, which is what our art league did, um, I mean, we had to wait a year or two to get him into our schedule. And for much less than it costs me to take from him, you're getting him and Rose Franson and Daniel Sprick. And I think one of the huge benefits of us all being stuck inside is that we can um, tune out the other things that are distressing us and just start focusing on our art. So thanks to Eric for really leading the charge on this. Other organizations are doing things similar, but you're really kind of leading the way. So thanks a lot for that and for inviting me to your studio in the Adirondacks and well, welcome to mine in Houston. Well, I'm I'm actually uh, I'm not in the Adirondacks yet. I'm still in Austin. Oh. Yeah, oh. so I'll be back in the Adirondacks in uh, 48 hours or less. And so, oh, I can't but uh, yeah, I'm I'm in, in in my studio. And you, I don't know if you were in the studio when you stayed at the World Famous Artist Cabin or not. I did. I poked my head in there. I should have snagged a few things. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not sure there's anything you would want. Maybe paintings by other people, mm -hmm. uh, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we had such a good time when you you were down here. Uh, you and Suze, you and Lynn Boyer stayed in the world famous artist cabin, and uh, it was a lot of fun. We went to dinner, got to know each other, spent a lot of time together, and that was great. We do uh, when we do realism live, just like when we did plein air live. We have some segments where artists who are able to come. You know, a lot of people won't get on an airplane, but some of them, like you, Susie, you're mm -hmm. you're in Houston, right? North of Houston, right? North of Houston. Easy drive. The Easy Woodlands? Drive Austin. Right, yeah. exactly. 
You're right. So, so easy drive to Austin. So that was, that was great. And we're really appreciative that you did it. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today is because that you were so popular. Everybody loved your teaching style. Uh, there's so much to learn from you. So I thought we'd just have you on and just talk about anything you want to talk about. And, and I'll, uh, I'll pull in some questions from time to time, but tell us you're, you're in your studio now. Is that right? I am. I'm in the back area of my studio, which is um, kind of a whole front area of my home, which is sort of like the we have an old ranch style home from the 70s, really typical rectangles and rectangles. And the whole um, formal living and dining room is my studio. But if you've been following me on Facebook, you'll see that I am also taking this opportunity where I'm at home to build out my garage and it's it's going to be pretty great. It's it's been a lot of fun planning because I haven't spent any money yet. <laughs> but anyway, but I am in the back area of my studio. I have my um, those sort of carpeted panels, um, sort of lining the walls, and it allows me to sort of hang my work, which we talked about, and get up off the floor. Do you do you bring uh, people, collectors or others, to buy your work at your studio? You know, I haven't done that so so far. Um, mostly people find me online or I go to them or I do events around the country or I see them in galleries. Um, but yes, if a, a gallerist or somebody wants to make an appointment with me, then, then we can do that. And what I anticipate after I build my studio is having this more of a show space because if, <laughs> if I were to turn my camera around, it's it's pretty crappy looking. It's very messy, which most art studios are. So, yeah, um, yeah. I get that. Like by nature, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, so this is a, pro, is it a pro panel? Yeah, that's exactly what they are. Yeah, yeah. from, um, yeah, I bought them. I think they're up in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. They're super, very useful. They last a good long time. Yeah, I, th I think they're nice. I don't have any of those. I, I, uh, I thought I was a smart guy and I was going to try and save the money and not do that. So uh, I had a carpenter build some walls in my garage and uh, ended up costing me about four times more than those. And the problem is I can't move the walls. They're so big and so heavy. Uh, they're on rollers, but they, you know, they'll fall over. They're top heavy. So I had to tie them together. So I think you were smart to get those. I, I think I'll do that on the next move. Yeah. Yeah, they're super useful too, and I'll um, I'll bring them to. Um, I'm involved with Oil Painters of America, but I'll bring them to OPA events and things like that. So lend them to friends who are doing shows. I, I used to do a lot more shows, but not so much anymore now that I travel or used to travel last year with plein air events. Now you're you're being modest. You said you're involved with Oil Painters mm -hmm. of America, but tell us the real truth. Well, I've, I've been on the board since 2013, 2014, and I am currently president of OPA. It's a great, just great history. And, uh, and you know, Eric, we're sort of following in your footsteps with our um, national show, which, you know, you're on your plan C or you were on your plan C for the plein air convention. Um, with having the date, moving the date, doing it virtually. And we're basically doing the same thing with our national show. So we're going to have a, a virtual convention and then a worldwide paint out since we can now. And I think, I think because we're, we were forced to learn so much about how to exist in this virtual world, I, I believe it's going to really help us moving forward. And uh, yeah. Well, I think so too. And yeah. As you know, we had a lot of people who came who would never have been able to get on an airplane for whatever reason. And, and the same thing will happen to OPA. Now, this is a great opportunity for you to tell everybody briefly what OPA is, what its mission is, and why they should consider being a member. Right. So Oil Painters of America is going on its 30th year. We, um, Our goal is to elevate and to represent representational oil painters and to promote that. We have three to 4,000 members. Um, every year we have, oh, four or five shows, depending on the year. Our biggest one is our national show, which has literally just been hung, hung in Fredericksburg. In fact, Rose Franson, one of your guests on Realism Live, is our judge. R Rose is amazing. Another reason to sign up for Realism Live. Her, her teach, she is very well known, very well regarded. 
And um, so actually tomorrow I will be kind of heading your way and going to the gallery in Fredericksburg, Texas to assist her as she judges. She's gonna have to judge remotely, but we will be on hand. So over 2000 entries into our national show and a couple hundred pieces get in. So for collectors, it's like a one-stop shop for all the best artists that are doing representational work in America. And another thing that we're doing is we're normally with our convention, we have a wet paint competition, which is just for people who are attending. But this year it's a two day international. You don't have to be an American or live in North America to participate. So it's, uh, you know, it's again, it's sort of making lemonade out of the lemons that we got. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and good things will happen because of it. You'll you'll learn a lot. People will learn about you that otherwise would wouldn't have a chance, and that'll be terrific. Now, tell me about the uh, the three letters, the OPA that you see behind some signatures. Tell me how you accomplish that that status. Right. So OPA means that you are a signature member of Oil Painters of America. OPA M means that you are a master member. So in order to achieve signature membership, it's it's no mean feat. You need to have been accepted into or juried into three, at least three national shows in a five-year period, um, or actually, or two national shows and three of our regional um, or salon shows. And then you can apply to be a signature. And your application will be reviewed by five master or signature members, and you will either get the designation or you won't. But then we, because um, it's so difficult uh, a moniker to achieve, then we've also set an automatic signature designation where if you are in five national shows, oh, well, maybe it's a 10 year period. I should know that, but it's on our website, oilpaintersofamerica.com. Then you will earn um, automatic membership. Now, and master is a whole different ball of wax. You also apply for that. Um, I think like right now is the application period for master, but um, you really, you, you will be judged by five master artists. And um, honestly, most who apply don't get it and don't get it the first time. Um, and it, it ought to be difficult. You know, there ought to be a meaning to having master. To well, the word master about. is thrown yeah. around very loosely. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, and I, by the way, I'm, I'm just as guilty of doing it. Um, and there are people who I, I believe have achieved master status, but I think that we have to be really careful about just throwing it around loosely because some people mm -hmm. have really earned it, have spent, you know, mm -hmm. decades and decades learning and getting to a certain level. And we, right. we want to earn it. I would think that it's very important that they're picky. Right. I mean, it, it, the designation says that you have mastery of your subject, that not only that, but you also have influence in your field. So um, Sherry McGraw is one of our masters and she is, and so is David LaFell, um, Kwong Ho, uh, you know, these are people that undeniably, uh, Richard Schmidt, undeniably have influence beyond people enjoying their artwork, but they've also influenced other artists. So, yep. All right. So what are you going to show us today? Okay. So I thought what I would do is basically like some studio basics. So you have all of these people that are um, attending these conventions or watching the videos that you're offering um, for free or the conventions for nominal prices and they're excited they're painting a lot they might already be um, junking up a corner of their house with stacks and stacks of canvases and I'm going to offer you some ways to um, produce more work easily without making things really dear and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tilt down my camera here onto my workspace and what I've got here is this is a Centurion Oil Prime Deluxe, but it's a tablet of loose linen. Now, lots of artists use this brand. It, it, you do not have to use this brand because I recommend it. There are lots of very good brands out there. But what I would do is um, very typically I would grab, rather than take a panel 
or certainly a stretch canvas to a portrait group or out on a plein air exhibition, um, expedition, not exhibition, is I would just grab one of these because what I want to do is practice and learn, but not necessarily create a masterpiece. And when you're dealing with one little floppy piece of linen, then this is not a, um, this is not a deer or a intimidating surface. Like if I mess this up, then I pull it out and it goes into a stack, but I didn't just feel like I, I wasted a piece of, of canvas. So you can buy these from, um, actually this brand right here is carried by Jerry's Artorama, um, or I think they have a warehouse supplier, art supply warehouse maybe. Same company, um, yeah. Yeah, same company. And you, ha you have to have sort of a membership to that one, but you can save a lot. So this is like a nine by 12 pad. Um, this is a 12 by 16, or sorry, 16 by 20 pad. But what, I, mean, I just wanna show you or flip through some of my things. Really handle, handy for doing your, your, um, your charts, which is outlined so beautifully in Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima or lots of places online. So how do you get um, your squares so perfect? Do you have some kind of a template that you lay down? I use um, little, I, I buy that white tape. I wish I had it right here at my fingertips, but it is a white tape that I spread and make the grid pattern. So I, I saw I something advertised recently, not in my magazine, but I saw something advertised as someone is now making a template. So you tape the template down and then you just paint in the squares. Right, right, right. Let me, um, I'll, I just walked over to my cabinet. So this is a, a white removable tape. And uh, I mean, I don't want to diminish that, the pattern that that person made, but you could also just measure it out, yeah. put the tape on, and then the tape peels off really easily. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. It looks good. It's very professional. Yeah. So then this is from, um, this is just from a workshop I did with Rob Liberace. And so now I've got a loose piece of canvas that I did one drawing and flipped it over and did another. And like I said, when you're painting on something like this, you're not feeling like this is something that I can't mess up or that I can't practice on. Well, and you can also pin it up. You don't have to frame it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, right, right. So here's another little painting from a portrait group. Um, you know, painting on part of the canvas. That This is actually from a Dan, the Dan Gerhardt's workshop. So you can see his influence of his knowledge of moving from warm to cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. Like Dan has some things that he can teach you that will just change the way you see things and change your painting moving forward. You know, again, from a workshop, this time with Clayton Beck. Um, and then just, you know, portrait group things. You're sitting in a portrait group and you know, maybe someday somebody, will, this isn't even on my website, so it's just in my drawers. Um, that's another Dan Gerhardt's workshop painting right there. Okay, so another thing I do with the, the loose canvas is I might tape it off and do go to a portrait group and see how many I can get through or save it for another one. So what do you, uh, when you, you have this loose canvas, Susie, do you... Um, do you mount it onto a board? Do you just leave it in the pad? How do you do it? Yeah, both. So if it becomes a, um, a keeper or something that maybe I wasn't intentionally painting something that I want to frame, but it turns out to be, then I can mount it on a board. And after we get through this part, I will show you how to do that. No, but what I meant is when you're painting it, when you're painting it, how, do you just leave it on the pad? Yes, right. When I'm painting it, it stays on the pad. So here's what I do. So the pad is very rigid. It's got a nice cardboard backing. And, um, and by the way, you don't have to do it on the pad. You could just get a roll of canvas, which let me take this opportunity to tilt this back up. Okay, so over here in my corner, that is a big, big roll. That's like a seven, eight foot roll, six yards of the same canvas bought from Art Supply Wholesaler. and um, you can get that same brand in the panels, which I will tell you a lot of artists use this panel on the plein air circuit. I see this logo. They have um, oil prime, deluxe, and acrylic prime, both nice smooth surfaces. 
Um, sometimes you like things slicker or toothier, but you'll learn what you like. Um, you can also get the same canvas on a stretcher. Um, but let me also take this opportunity to show you one of the benefits of mounting your linen on something that is rigid is that from an archival standpoint, that linen um, or canvas or what have you is not going to expand and contract, expand and contract in different weather conditions or humidity conditions, which can lead to cracking. The other problem is that, okay, so here, here is this painting. There is a really nice, do you see that little tear right there? Yeah. So that the corner, the corner of something punctured that. Now, if I decide to that I want to try to sell this painting or or then I can mount this, I can glue this down to my backing that I'm going to show you later, and I can repair that little area. But if if this were already on the rigid surface instead of this, you know, drum like surface, then that wouldn't have happened. So. Right. Well, and the other problem is it can happen, you know, to a collector. It can happen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at any time in the future. Right, right, right. So that rigid surface, um, future uh, uh, gallerist and conservators will thank you for using it. Okay, so we sort of, all right, yeah, and, and here's just another quick, this is not a painting that is a whole lot fun to look at. But what I learned from this is that I, this painting was done in about 25 strokes. So the assignment was to um, how, how to look more and to paint less and to do things where you're really viewing. So an, on an assignment that I give myself or get in a workshop, then putting it on something floppy like this is not as intimidating. Okay, so... Then, like you said, sometimes you come up with a keeper in a portrait group, and then I will mount it on a rigid surface, which is my gator board. And I'm going to show you how to mount that in a minute. And Great. then also just so it's not a complete advertisement for Centurion Oil Prime Deluxe. This is a little piece of impregnated oil paper. And this is a study that I did of um, before going to Laguna Beach Plein Air from my, um, let's see, I don't want that to fall over, from, from this painting right here in my Dean Cornwell book, who was a great illustrator. But I don't know if you can see the, the um, seagulls. So you know when you're painting in plein air, seagulls don't like to stay in midair and hover for you so you can study them. So some of the things that we might do ahead of time is to is to practice or learn or draw. And so um, I couldn't work from a photograph, but I could put this up next to my easel and use it for reference. Um, right. So in that later on, I could mount that on the gator board as well. Right. All right. And now I also have this is something that I was doing over the winter where I can you see the texture here? Yep. That is a burlap with the Gamblin oil ground. So just trying some, some different things, different textures. That linen is a real smooth texture. So here's a painting. And you can get different, uh, you know, different feelings, different techniques, you know, and just. It feels feel like very can... Russian. Oh, right. All that really thick paint. And it almost speaks to like a, um, a very pedestrian surface, you know, yeah. with that, with a highly textured thing. Um, and then this is just a Clausen's. Um, this is a Clausen's linen. So again, a little more texture. And because I pre-mount them on the gator board, um, I can carry this with me. And if I feel like the painting um, wants to have more tooth, um, to it and see how that works in the field, then, then I have some options. And then the other huge benefit of painting on this sort of loose linen is that you end up with a stack like this as opposed to a stack that might, you know, be a lot bigger. And certain, and that's just if it was on panels. So, I mean, I just have drawers of things like this. Um, you know, some things that won't, won't really ever see the light of day, but things I might want to refer back to and remember what I learned from that particular exercise. You know, in, in Russia, um, 
anytime you go to buy uh, paintings like that, they're typical. They're typically not stretched. They're loose canvas. Uh, they'll roll them up and ship them. And uh, so it's it's. I have stacks of paintings I got in Russia just like that that are are just loose. Uh, pieces of canvas. And that's kind of the way things are done over there. And and we don't do it as much here, but I think it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, I have, I'm looking right now at my stacks. I'll, I'll just show real quickly. Um, you know, I have stacks of, let's see here, stacks of, of panels that just take up lots of space and I barely right. will ever look at them. And they are, uh, and, and for everyone that's there, there are 10 more stacks like that. So I think it's really important to, to try this. I, I'm going to go out and buy some of that uh, this weekend. Oh, good. All right. Well, they have got a convert already. Okay. So um, what I like to mount it on now, some people can mount, you can mount it on um, even the like hardboard. But this is Gator Board, or uh, that's actually the brand name, sort of like Q-Tip. We, you know, we call all Q-Tips Q Q-Tips, whether right. it's not they're the Q-Tip brand or Kleenex, that sort of thing. But um, let me tilt this back up again. So I order mine in groups of, you can get it from Uline for about, I want to say it's about $25, $22 to $25 per, um, I think it's 30 by 42 sheet of it. And you get 10 at a time. So that might be pretty pricey if all you want is a couple pieces. But what I know a lot of people do is they agree with their friends that they're going to order that. And then they'll just split the shipment. Um, I've done that before with uh, my friends, uh, Deborah Latham and Crystal Brown. And we've just, you know, maybe got 20 sheets and split them so that, um, you know, we're, we're only paying the shipping once, but getting more bang for the buck that way. All right, Good let me tip. tilt this back down. Okay. Um, all right, so I have a little piece right here that is 12 by 16. Nope, that's not right. 6 by 12. So to give you an idea, this is what a 6 by 12 painting might look like. This is from a little a hike that I did in um, the Cotswolds in England. And the nice thing about putting it on the gator board is this is very lightweight. So the difference between gator board and foam core board, which you would not want to use, is foam core board, you could press it with your thumb and make an indentation. And pretty soon you're going to pretty ha have a pretty janky little piece. But this is very firm, very rigid, and, um, and very lightweight. So for airplane travel or um, backpack, you know, it's a lightweight um, substrate. Okay, and then before I mount linen on this, here's a piece that I already have linen mounted on. And this is just a little, um, like a little remnant, so to speak. So I have a whole, a whole box of small little panels, lots of little remnants um, of pieces that I just sort of keep because I might want to pull them out. And um, this is a little cloud study that I, let's see, oh, that's kind of weird. That's not showing very well. That's a little cloud study that I did from some of William Wentz work. So is this, and then sometimes if I want to see how my different warm, warm blue colors work with different whites, you know, so I could just pull out a little remnant like this and do little things like this. So, yeah. and then keep that in my drawer with my colors. Um, so maybe I don't want to do a whole color, um, a color chart or see how, see how three colors mix together with white. Then I have sort of a, a little, a little thing of stuff that I can pull from. Okay. So let's get, all right, here's what I wanted to show you. So this, all right, so here are my tools. Let's get everything where we can see it. So the tools that you need, and first let me talk, so Studio Basics. This little mat right here, this is a 24 by 36 self-healing mat. You can get them from Michael's. You could, I've, I've been told that you can get larger ones like from Joanne's Fabrics. So you can take your 40% off coupons and go buy that. And then right before I got on the call, I looked, because I, 
when I'm building at my studio, I want to have like a big three by six foot table. And I see for a couple hundred dollars, I can cover the whole table with the mat, which when you are cutting big pieces of cardboard, because you're wanting to build a special box to ship a painting to a collector, then having to move this mat around um, so that you're not cutting into your table, just having the whole cut table covered is helpful. But this is one of those sort of indispensable studio basics. Okay, another is a good exacto knife. Um, I've cut fingers more than I'd like to say with things like this, even recently. So be careful. Um, this little, this says Gerber Scientific Products, Inc. I have had this forever. I have no idea where I got it from. But I'm sure that if you just looked for a little squeegee, you could find something like that online. And then a, a good metal rulers, um, other studio basic that you just, just need to have one. And then this is just a basic brush. This is a little stiff rosemary brush that I use for putting on my glue. Okay, I want to show you how easy this is to cut on this one small piece. So I'm not really be, going to be too concerned with measuring it. But um, so I'm a lefty if this looks peculiar to you. But I'm going to use my, um, what do you call this? Not a mat razor knife. knife. Yeah, yeah, where you can switch out the razors, right? Get that back in there. All right, so standing up above it, pressing down hard, and then and then cutting. Now what, hey, Eric, do you remember what Bob Vila said about um, cutting? No. Measure twice, cut once. On yeah, like yeah. This old house show. <laughs> yeah. So if I were really needing to, this to be precise, I would definitely want to measure twice. So easy to cut. And actually, that's not what I meant to show you. What I meant to show you was, you can also just sort of score this. I know people also cut the pre-made panels, but they're much more difficult to cut. And then you can score it and snap it. And it cuts very, very easily. Okay, so here I have my, um, my six by 12 inch piece. I'm gonna come down here and grab, I'm gonna go ahead and grab my little panel. So sometimes let's, you may already have a painting that you want to mount, in which case you want to make sure that it is good and dry before you try to mount it. But sometimes, and a lot of times what I do is I sort of pre-make my panels and put them in frames and get ready to do plein air events. Because I want to have at least two panels. Uh, maybe I want to pre-tone one and not the other. And per frame when I do a plein air event. Okay, so this is a, a 9 by 12 piece of linen, and this is a, a 6 by 12 piece of um, skater board. All right, so here is the glue that I'm going to use. This is a glue that I think, again, it's from Lineco. Um, it's a neutral pH adhesive. Somebody so write that down in the, uh, in the comments. It's Lineco adhesive. Yeah, L-I-N-E-C-O, adhesive, neutral pH. Um, I just got like a whole gallon of it from, um, I think I got it at Jerry's Autorama. So the wholesaler place would have it too. But I also have the smaller bottle, which you can see I need to replace because I fixed with duct tape for now. Because it's just a lot easier to get a, a measured amount out of this bottle than out of this one. So this refills the small little ketchup bottle. So all you do is put on a nice little bit of your glue. And brush it pretty evenly and pretty liberally. Does it dry fast? It does dry pretty quick. And um, make sure you get it all the way out to the edges. You want to cover everything. Now, I will say, like, if you're mounting a 16 by 20 sheet of 16 by 20 linen on a 16 by 20 cut piece, it'll want to shrink up a little bit. So make sure you account for that, that it's going to be framed and that the lip of the frame will cover that shrinkage. So I'm going to turn my linen upside down. I'm going to put my glued piece on there. And I'll just, well, let's see, I'll put it down here. Yeah, then you don't waste all that. 
Nice. Yeah, I might have a little script that I could put on something else. Um, and then I'm going to take my little squeegee. Now, if this were a if this were an actual painting, I would cover it with a piece of um, vellum or something so that I'm not scraping right across the painting. But then you squeegee that out from the center out. All right. And then one of the benefits of spending a lot of money on Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima II and your gardener's art through the ages uh, <laughs> art, art history textbook from college is that they now become really great and useful weights for your, your work. Now, people will say to sort of let this dry overnight, but I find that it sets up very, very quickly in just a few minutes and or, well, like an hour. Um, and I do lots of them all at once. Um, so I sort of plan a day where I'm making my panels. But um, let's pretend this was a cooking show and I had another one of these in the wings. Um, and this were already dry. But then I can just go and take my knife and just trim off the excess. And I have either a very nice new fresh panel or I have just mounted a painting that I did and decided was a keeper. So there you go. Very nice. I, I hope I covered all that pretty well. You um, did. And then do, do we have a little bit more time? Yeah, we've I got mean, we've got a little bit more time. All right. So um, now let's say you have decided that you did a painting, you liked it, you put it on a, a rigid surface, and now you want to kind of start, start framing it. Um, when I first started doing this, um, and my price points was pretty low, you know, just going to a place like Hobby Lobby or Michael's with your 40% off coupon, um, the trick here is that to paint standard sizes. Here, let me tilt this back up. So painting standard sizes, um, 8 by 10, 11 by 14, 12 by 16, 16 by 20. These are all standard sizes. And your tablets, by the way, will come in standard sizes too. So you've got a painting, you've mounted it, and you want to pop it in a frame that you get from an art supply store. Because at this point, you're just putting it on your own wall because it's marking your progress as an artist. Um, other artists will, when you start maybe moving further and wanting to sell your work um, in galleries, then there's other resources like um, Randy Higby's King of Frames or Pat McDaniel at JFM, um, some really nice high-end frames from places like Masterwork Frames. There's lots of resources out there for both um, to pre-order your frames, both in standard sizes and in sizes that are um, that are that are custom. So um, let me show you what I will often do then. All right. So this is. Let me point this back down. So this is a JFM frame. Um, it's sort of a, a gray color. And this is what I will do when I'm preparing a work to either drive to a plein air show or um, ship it to a plein air show um, in a box. So I'll, I'll wrap and protect the frame, often more than this with cardboard in between. But I'll go ahead and cut a panel or two and put it in my frame so that everything is together and I know I have what I need when I get there. Great idea. When, one tip that I have to thank. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, okay, good. That's what I was going to ask you is uh, you've already prepared the back of the frame. Right, right. If I'm really going to be nice to myself, I will prepare the back of the frame. I will have it pre-wired. I will even put my, um, my point driver, I will go ahead and put that in because I can easily sort of peel this up and take the, the thing out. But I will have my, my resume and... Um, what do you call that? Short bio. And then I have a brochure. So this is called the provenance of every painting so that the buyer or, you know, future curator can look through and tell when this painting was done and by whom and in what year. So this one happens to have a sticker from Laguna Plain Air Invitational on it. So this is a panel that I um, didn't end up using. 
Um, but it's all prepared and ready. So when I'm really nice to myself, I do that all ahead of the event so that I don't have to do it at an event. Particularly if I'm flying, I want to do that. Okay. Well, I think that but makes a lot of sense. I you know, you do that ahead of time and I sort of prep my stuff. We're starting to lose you. You're freezing up. Can you hear me? Oh, yep, I can hear you now. Okay, seems to be okay now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I do is I went to um, Home Depot. I got like a $5 Husky toolbox, and I kind of retrofitted it to be my grab-and-go um, framing thing. I even um, cut a little hole and put a bolt through the side so that... I could put my framing wire um, normally. So this had gotten really snaggly and that's why it's still snaggly because I don't want to waste it. But the idea is, is when I replace this, it's going to pull out of there pretty well. I even cut my gator board to make some dividers. So in here I have my, um, I have my brochure. I've got little, cut pieces to protect uh, corners, tape, point driver, point, my point driver, which you'll see in a minute, a staple gun, a ruler. So basically like all my sort of grab and go things that I need. Here's my electric. Um, oh, you've got it down. <laughs> I know. I even, I even try to make sure I charge it ahead of time. And then little containers for screws and, um, what do you call these things? The little D-rings? Yeah, hangers. Yeah, a little needle nose plier. This is a, like a, a small jeweler's one. Um, Sharpies, which no artist with the, is without. Here's another great little tool. This is rub and buff. So that when your frame gets a little scuffed, which they always do, um, you can get it in brown and silver and gold. You know, right on Amazon. Um, all right, so there are my tools. So let's put that off to the side. And then here are a couple little paintings I did. Um, I took a trip with my daughter when she got her associates from college. Um, Eric, my kids too are about to start start back virtually to their college college courses. And um, and then here's a frame that I want to, to put it in. So um, let's let's do this one. Another nice thing about that that uh, pad underneath is it's not going to scratch up your, your frame. Oh, right, right. And you know what I, I really ought to do when I get that table built is coat it with that sort of indoor-outdoor carpet and then put my pad on top, and then I can yeah. just have the best of both worlds. It's yeah. been a lot of fun planning. I haven't spent any money yet, so it's, it's only been the fun part. <laughs> okay, here's another nice little frame from JFM. This is 6 by 8 and then here's my um, panel. This one, actually, this looks like something I bought at the plein air convention. So it's a masterpiece, hardcore. So it's got a, a nice little texture to it. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little glary. Um, what is this? Okay, so this is me sort of butchering one of those pre-made. Um, yep. Yeah, so that happens a lot too. <laughs> All right, so what you do is you just, Flip your board in there. All right, let's pull my thing over so you can see both. I'll reach in there and get my point driver. Um, this is something worth, in, worth investing in if you start to find that you're framing a whole lot. Otherwise, you, there's other things that you can do. Because these are, I don't know, maybe 60, 60 bucks or something like that. Oh, my gosh. I didn't refill my point driver. All right. Sing a little song for us, Eric, while we. Uh, what song shall I sing? Refill the Point Driver? <laughs> yeah, song? do you know that one? It's it's one of, it's a very famous song, I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right, done. Fast well, that took, a, it took no time. <laughs> that took no time at all. All right, there we go. So now that's securely in there. It's so much easier than, than trying to use screws or something. Plus, it looks so much more professional. Right. Yeah. 
you, sometimes you need to use things like these little step up pieces, which you can just get at Home yeah. Depot if you're if you're putting in a canvas. Right, but you're right. Having having screws is tough. So I've I've sort of pre-cut one of my little wires, which I would have done with my needle nose pliers. Let's make sure we're wiring this on the right part. Okay, so this is my top. There's my little screws. You do need to make sure that wherever you're putting your screw and that your screw isn't too long that it starts to poke out the other side of your frame, which um, sadly I have learned from experience. So you don't measure where you're putting that, you're just laying it down. Yeah, I'm just eyeballing it. About two, a third down from the top is a good place. And, and you're not measuring because the string will make up the difference if it's crooked. That's right. That's right. I mean, I guess if you're really anal retentive, you could do all that measuring, but I never have been. <laughs> so, all right. So this is a coated wire. I got it. Um, I'm sure I just ordered it off of Amazon a while back, but you just loop it through. I, I prefer the coated wire because you don't end up poking your fingers with the ends of the wire. Yeah. yeah. Much smoother. It look, looks and feels prettier too. It doesn't cost that much more. And you just circle it around and you have a framed piece. So there you go. Outstanding. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll sign that and put, information on the back um you know people people go to plein air events and sometimes it's their very first experience with buying art and i think of these sort of six by eights as being little gateway paintings <laughs> for collectors <laughs> so that they start thinking like oh i have an original piece of artwork that nobody else has it's not a, a kirkland's print but um and then oftentimes those people end up you know, liking that and um, having a nice memory from this is the Lower Falls in Yosemite, and it it reminds them of a place that they've been. Yeah, and then maybe later they'll come back and buy a bigger piece. Now I oh, noticed on your on your go back to your signature for just a second. Oh, yeah. um, it looks like you just took a uh, you, you scribbled mm -hmm. into the wet paint for your signature. Right. right. Yeah, that I just scratch. I will sharpen the end of my brush and I'll just um, scratch it right into the wet paint, which is really nice thing to do with plein air painting because so often they're a la prima and it really shows the immediacy of, of right. the act of plein air painting. Yeah. Now I do, um, let's see, I do have a technique too that I use. Maybe I can show it to you at some other time, but Let's see if you can see that. It might be a little too tone on tone. Nope, that's can't, too hard. Can't to see. see it. Nope. Yeah. Um, oh, here's one. Okay, this one here. Let's see how close. Can you read that? Yeah. See that? Yeah. That is done with a tool called a ruling pen. It comes like with old compass kits or protractor kits. And um, let's see. If I knew I had it handy, I could show you, but but it's a way to sort of liquefy my oil paint and then I write it right on there. Um, it's funny that you could do a whole painting and the hardest part is signing your name. <laughs> True. Oh my gosh. Well. Oh, look how shiny I am. It's hot here. My my AC can't keep up with the heat in Houston. Yeah, well, I don't know about you, but it's a, it's a hot day here. So uh -huh. Susie, this was fabulous. Thank you so yeah. much. You got all that done in a, in a short amount of time. And uh, so uh, <laughs> tell us exactly where we can find out more about you. Right. So my website is right there on my name, right here. So suzybaker.com. Go check out my website. You can easily sign up for a newsletter, which I send out once a month. Um, tips and ideas. If you sign up, I will also send you a welcome email that has my 16 top art supplies that are not actually art supplies, little surprises, one very funny one at the end from a friend, um, a friend of mine. And uh, so um, quickly tell everybody about this video that we did together. Oh yeah. Color magic. Eric, I wanted to call it plain, uh, what a color theory for plein air painters, but you said nobody, nobody would buy that. Make it color magic. <laughs> but Color magic is I, 
I basically give you the whole first day of my workshop, the color day of my workshop, where you can learn things about color and color theory and start seeing things in a different way. And um, whether you're, you're applying it and trying to copy the painting I did or just doing your own painting and seeing how light, primary light sources, secondary light sources, I mean, we go really deep. We talk about value, we talk about color, we talk about mixing color. I try to, I give you way a lot of information, <laughs> a whole lot of information. Yeah. And a well, demo. Excellent. And that's available at lilyartvideo.com. So, well, Susie, this is fabulous. Thank you. We actually have a couple of minutes left so that I'll be able to do some announcements. And, and, and thank you again for joining us on day 147. Yeah. And everybody, make sure you visit Susie's happy. website. For visit Susie's website for her. Uh, what did you say? It's a painting tools. Um, you'll get a welcome email of the 16 art supplies that aren't art supplies. And then you'll learn in the future about when I do workshops, painting tips, new art about once a but, month, nothing spam. And that's me. Right. Signing up for your newsletter. Yep. Sign up for my newsletter. Okay. Really great. easy to find on my website. Okay. Yeah. You guys applause for Susie Baker. Thank you so much. Thank you. We didn't get to any questions because there's so much to cover, but thank you, Susie. I will be here again tomorrow. Uh, God willing, you know, we're going to uh, get in the car in the next few minutes, drive to Arkansas. So uh, we'll uh, let you know how that goes. Thank you, 